Um, and I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel. Um, General uh, Peter Corelli, uh, retired U.S. Army and CEO of One Mind for Research. Um, Dr. Just, oh. Change up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we've got um, Morgan. <laughs> Soon you will be. Um, Morgan Luttrell, retired U.S. Navy SEAL. Um, panelist uh, Daryl Johnston, a former Dallas a cowboy and current NFL broadcaster. Now we have Dr. Justin Sanchez. He's the program manager, uh, Bio Biological Technologies Office of DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And uh, Dr. Lori Cook, director of pediatric brain injury programs at the Center for Brain Health at the University of Texas in Dallas. And. Uh, just to explain, I haven't owned a watch in many years. I know that you all have silenced your phones by now. I want you to know mine is silent too, but I need it to tell the time. So, <laughs> so this is a, a very distinguished, exciting panel, and um, let's get right to it. Um, I'd like to start by asking uh, General Corelli. Um, we hear a lot about post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury in the military. I think people have come to think of it as kind of the signature injury uh, for these wars in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, could, you, uh, could you start by kind of putting that in context, uh, the military uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, put it in context, how is that different or is it from civilian traumatic brain injury? Well, that, that, that's a great question because we really don't know. We, we don't know the difference between blast injury and, and, and blast trauma and, and quite frankly, the, the, the kind of head trauma that could be experienced on a football field or playing girl soccer or guy soccer or whatever. We, and, and that's one of the things researchers uh, have to help us understand. DARPA has been a great help there. They've provided us some blast sensors that we're hanging on soldiers so that when they do suffer some kind of a concussive event, we have data to understand right, that data. Oh, blast sensors? Blast sensors. Okay. You know, we, we hang three of them on, on, on each soldier, and they provide uh, you, just a treasure trove of data on exactly what the acceleration and overpressure was when that blast took place. You know, I, I, as I mentioned in my comments, I, I came at this because I was concerned about soldiers. I was the vice chief of staff in the Army. I had 1.1 million folks working for me, and I'm going to amend Congressman Fatah's numbers a little. But in 2008, when I took over as vice, uh, somebody put a chart in front of me. And that, that chart had the, 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 all the wounds, percentages of the most serious wounds that we had coming out of what at that time was seven years of war. It was a cohort of 3,600 folks, all with a single VA disqualifying injury of 30% or greater. And I fully expected because of my time uh, in Iraq that I was going to see on the far left-hand side with the highest column, those that had lost arms and legs or, or multiple limbs. But in reality, 2% uh, of our soldiers had some kind of spinal cord injury, suffered in combat, 4% had serious burns, 10% had lost an arm, a leg, or multiple limbs, and 36% at that time had traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress. Now that number, when I left as vice four years later, had gone to 67 percent, wow. had traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress. And, and that it was with a cohort of over 10,000 at that time, yet those who had lost arms and legs remained at 10 percent. So we, we, we've seen an increase for a whole bunch of reasons, and we can get into the questions and answers later, but we, we've seen an increase uh, in, in the military over time of these injuries. Uh, uh, one difference that is, is and I was at the University of Pittsburgh at their sports concussion clinic just last week. I spent a day there. Uh, they're doing amazing work. If anybody here, if you're one of the 3.4 million Americans that su suffers a concussive event every single year uh, and you've got some cognitive issues, I would highly recommend uh, University of Pittsburgh's sports clinic. It's absolutely amazing. But they indicated to me that as they look at military TBI, and soldiers who have traumatic brain injury, they see it compounded with post-traumatic stress. So we, my doctors were telling me we were seeing a comorbidity running 60 to 80%. Hmm. In other words, 
people who had traumatic brain injury also had a comorbid condition of post-traumatic stress. Um, and they indicated that those cases were particularly difficult for them as opposed to individuals who, who had a sports-related concussion, uh, trying to, 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 to treat both those conditions. So there's a lot of similarities, we think, uh -huh. but at the same time, there are differences, we think. I, I would like to end by saying is the, the real scary thing is we're talking about traumatic brain injury right now. And, and please, you're talking to a liberal arts major here, but I, I read everything I can on this, and, and I totally agree with Congressman Fatah that we're seeing a, more similarities in many of these things than we are differences as we start to understand the biology a little bit more. But I, I find it troubling that I'm told that we're seeing a higher incidence of early onset Parkinson's um, and, and epilepsy um, with soldiers who suffer concussive events uh, downrange. I, I, I'm fearful that 10 years from now, that's what we're going to be talking about. Right. What, what about the history that before uh, people in the military got into the military, are they more likely to have played sports and maybe suffered concussions? Be, you, you know, were an amazing straight man. <laughs> <laughs> that call worked. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we did a study called STARS. It was $50 million that we gave to the NIH to try to understand suicide. And they, um, they, they interviewed uh, over 250,000 members of the armed forces. And there was always this tendency to believe the last act caused the problem. And it may have. We would look at a kid who got blown up with an IED downrange who had serious cognitive issues and had to be medically discharged from the Army, and we say that's why it happened. But what we found when we interviewed these kids is because of the cohort that we appeal to, we're seeing many kids are coming in the, in the military with four, five, six, seven concussions, already suffered playing some kind of contact sports or high impact something prior to ever joining the military. So we don't really know. Is it the blast event? Is that the straw that breaks the camel's back? Or is it accumulation of all these events over time? Yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to stick with some of the research areas before we get into um, the uh, Daryl's and uh, Morgan's stories. Um, so, um, I, uh, Dr. Sanchez, um, my first question is pretty basic, pretty simple. Um, what is it that you do? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a great question. <laughs> um, so, uh, just to echo some of the uh, the comments by the the congressman here is. Um, we have an, an international focus on brain research ongoing right now, a, a focus on brain health. And you know, this is a, I think this is one of those times in history where we're gonna look back and when we see our societies really coming together to uh, push into this frontier and say, how do we understand the brain in all of its complexity? How do we use that knowledge to develop next generation kinds of therapies? And then ultimately, how do we uh, you know, really push forward into the future in terms of using our knowledge of, of brain circuits and brain systems to change multiple aspects of, of, of society. And at DARPA, you know, we're very much focused on those futuristic kinds of goals. That's our charge, that's our mission, uh, is how do we push out in, into that frontier. And um, while there has been this international um, effort to try to understand the brain at DARPA, we ask questions like, how do we deepen our understanding of the brain and how do we build therapies in such a way that they help our military personnel. And uh, all of us here know that our military personnel are subject to extraordinary stress, extraordinary injury, have to control complex systems on very complex missions, and the brain is involved in every one of those uh, very different situations. Um, a little history here. Uh, looking back to the 2000s, DARPA started asking a lot of deep questions about the brain and uh, one of the ways that DARPA thought you know, that the agency could really make a huge impact is developing the field of neuroprosthetics or neural interfaces. So to directly answer your question, what field do I work in? It's this one of neuroprosthetics and neural interfaces. And many of you may be asking, you know, what, what are these kinds of devices? What, what do they do? You know, what can they deliver back for the brain? Well, a neuroprosthetic is, is unlike probably anything that you've ever seen, it's a direct interface into the brain. It's a direct way of measuring the activity of you know, hundreds or thousands of neurons. Uh, it's taking that information and analyzing it, analyzing it and, and doing something useful with it in real time 
and then making a decision about how to use that information. That could be to restore movement back to somebody who's been paralyzed uh, in service of our country. Or it could be, let's say, restoring a memory to somebody who has had a traumatic brain injury and has lost the ability to recognize their loved ones. A neuroprosthetic can potentially do something like this. Now, you may be saying, you know, this is in the domain of science fiction. Well, it's not, okay? We have developed some very early kinds of technology. You may have seen a 60-minute story uh, very recently where we had a, a woman who was completely paralyzed from the neck down. She had one of these neuroprosthetic devices implanted in, in the cortex of her brain, and that neuroprosthetic device read out her intent to move, and we sent that signal to a prosthetic limb, and it, and it moved in real time. And the remarkable aspect about all of this is that it was as, as natural as moving her, home, her own arm. And you can imagine, you know, how transformative, transformative is this for somebody? Think of being completely paralyzed and being dependent upon every aspect of your life being taken care of by somebody else. If you have a neuroprosthetic device like this and it can give you that independence back, it changes the world for you. And that's what an investment, you know, like what comes from DARPA can really do. We can change worlds for people by developing these new technologies. What might be some of those applications for other kinds of trauma? Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, so uh, we have four new programs that are in support of the President's Brain Initiative. And we're moving beyond, you know, the restoration of movement and pushing into places like neuropsychiatric health. All right, so if you think about all of the sub-circuits of the brain that contribute to neuropsychiatric illness and the way that they're traditionally treated, right? You can go and talk to your, your clinician, lay out on the couch and hope for the best. Or you can take some medications and again, hope for the best over a very long period of time. We think that our knowledge in neuroprosthetics and neural interfaces that have the capability of going to all of these subsystems of the brain, recording that information, interpreting it, trying to figure out what's wrong with those circuits, and then delivering very precise and targeted therapies back to those brains can make a, a huge difference uh, moving into the future. Another area that we're, uh, again, working in is I, I gave this example of a memory restoration. So many people that are suffering from traumatic brain injuries of, let's say, the temporal lobe, their hippocampus is damaged. They have the inability to form memories. Uh, again, we think that we can develop neuroprosthetic devices that can directly interface with the hippocampus and can restore the first type of memory that we're looking at, declarative memories, right? Things, it, things related to facts. And again, you know, we, we talk about that family connection there, right? If you've been injured in the line of duty and you can't remember your family, we want to be able to restore those kinds of, uh, of functions. So it's extremely important to us and we really think that we can make a big impact in this area. Okay. And, um, Dr. Cook. Um, what, what's, uh, what's different about children when a, when a child gets a traumatic brain injury? It, uh, what's different about that, that it's happening to a young developing brain? Well, quite frankly, younger is not better. You know, it, it, for many years we always thought that the younger you are, the more resilient you are. And while that may be true in many senses when it comes to brain injury, in fact, quite the opposite is most typically true. And, we really consider the fact that your brain is still developing until your mid to late 20s. You know, we always joke the neuroscientists, uh, really the rental car companies figured this out before the neuroscientists did. They were onto something. And so you imagine if you incur an injury to a brain that's in development, you might actually see some problems that, that won't even be obvious right away, but, but may emerge years later when their brain hits another stage of development or when they're at a stage of life when they're different skills are being called upon, different aspects of the brain are being called into action. Okay. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, they can hear you just fine, keep going. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll speak up. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so by that token, I'd say the biggest difference when we consider a brain injury in a child, and we use the term child really loosely, we could be talking up to age 25 here, um, it, it's going to require some long-term monitoring. Just okay. when they're sent home from the hospital, that's, that's not the end. We really need to be vigilant to, to continue to follow these kids and make sure that we don't see some problems pop up, maybe even years down the road. Okay, okay. 
Um, it, it, this uh, leads to a whole bunch of other questions, but I want to uh, touch on all the panelists first. And um, uh, Morgan, um, <laughs> can you, yes, could you please tell us your story? You're a Navy SEAL, retired Navy SEAL. Yes, ma'am. Um, did you say nine missions? Uh, nine deployments. Mission? Nine combat deployments. Yes, ma'am. No, okay. Okay. Um, what happened to you, and how did you? How do you happen to be? sitting here in fine shape right now. Well, I am the lucky recipient of a traumatic brain injury. Uh, most recent one, actually, was in 2009 when my platoon and I were in a helicopter crash uh, during a training op off the coast of Virginia. The helicopter rotor struck the ship and tore the rotor off, so the, the Black Hawk flipped over and plummeted down to the, to the ship beneath, and we were all still inside. And, Lost one, injured eight. Uh, I personally broke my back in six places. Uh, lost the feeling and use of my legs for a little while and uh, sustained a traumatic brain injury. Coming to about a month later is when I started to realize where I was and who I was. Uh, since then, it's been a challenge to put the pieces back together, but through the... But what was the road? What was the road to putting it back together? We're great at putting the human body back together. Science today can do anything with any part of the body. If, you lose, if I lost my legs, that would probably be the greatest thing that ever happened to me because I was born with chicken legs and a large body. It, it, it's disheartening, but that's just the true fact of it all. I have teammates, one of them in the room with us today who's lost legs, and the greatest thing about that is they can put legs back on you and you can be faster and taller and better looking, in my, in my opinion. I mean, we have guys that run in the Olympics with uh, prosthetic legs. I mean, that's the greatest thing ever. Lose an arm, we can put one back on you. The, 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 the problems that I ran into was there wasn't much that anybody was doing with the neck up. The, the neck up checkup is, is what I, how I like to refer to it. And through, again, I was in Bethesda. I was at the Naval Medical Center Portsmouth and Andrews Institute and Athletes Performance and NICO. And all those places did great things for me. I ended up coming back stronger and faster than I ever was before and doing two more deployments. But the, the, what was plaguing me what was, is what was happening, happening upstairs. And just the, the, the fog, I'd say fog of war, but I wasn't at war. It was just the fog of everyday life. And finally, my, my roommate actually is the one that introduced the Center for Brain Health to me and the smart, Dr. Chapman and the SMART program. And that's how I, I got my life back in check and was able to rejoin my team and, and go forward and do great things for our country. Uh, are you still getting treatment, or do you still, um, I mean, what lies ahead? I don't get treatment. Okay. Okay, treatment is a negative term in our, in our world. We get training. Okay. If you're going to send okay. me to get treatment, I'm not going to go. Okay. Okay, I've been okay. treated enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do training, and I train my brain. I train my body every day as part of, of, of being in the military or being a SEAL. And I was telling this story the other day. I was like, if you go into the most remote places anywhere in the world where we are, if there is one hardened structure, there will be a gymnasium in there. There won't be a kitchen. There won't be a bed. There will be a gym, period. So we're really good about training our bodies. And I digress. I train my brain every day through what I learned at the, at the Center for Brain Health and the SMART program. That's how I line myself out. And that's what makes Morgan function every day. And it's ongoing. Yes, ma'am. It, yeah. it, it has to be. If, if when you stop training your body or your brain, you crawl down the rabbit hole. I mean, what's the point of existence unless you're going to continue to climb the ladder of life? This is Morgan's opinion, of course. <laughs> that's why you're here. <laughs> um, so, Daryl Johnston, we've been hearing a lot about NFL injuries, uh, concussions and, and brain injury suicides and uh, early deaths and early dementia. Um, how, how has professional football changed since this has come to light and how so? Uh, there's been dramatic changes. Um, I get asked quite often, should I let my son play the game of football? Mm -hmm. um, for me, the answer is really easy. Number one, I tell the moms and dads, this has to be a decision that you come together with your son. 
and, and make it for the best interest of all the parties involved. Number one, you got to check the coaches, check the league that's going to be in. But know full well going forward, the game of football has never been safer than it is right now with all the changes that have been made from the NFL level and pushing down and all the advances that we've made in this field. What we hear about the majority of the time are the tragedies. We hear about Dave Dorson, we hear about Junior Seau, we hear about the young man at the Naval Academy this past spring that died from a head injury. Um, we, we don't hear about all the great things that are being done in this field. Uh, the impact of, of getting a, a, a baseline test done at a young age and being able to come back to that monitor, that return to play is something that has dramatically changed, that, that is absolutely huge. You know, when we played, how many fingers? Two, all right, go back in. Uh, the, we had no baseline. My baseline for the first time was when I was 44 years old. So there are a number of great things that are happening regarding the game of football that are making it quite safe. Uh, you can see some of the rule changes that the NFL has put in place. Uh, when I played, they had uh, the, the kickoff, kickoff return area is, is the one play that has the most violent collisions. You're talking about, you know, 35 to 40 yards of space that six foot three, 255 pound guys are running full speed into each other. And we used to line up with a four man wedge and you had two wedge busters that would come down. It, it is by far the most violent collision there is every Sunday and it was happening on a specific play. The NFL evaluates every year, you know, how the concussion happened. And one of the things I saw was this is happening a lot on the kickoff. So let's push the kickoff to the 35 yard line. The ball starts traveling out of the end zone. There was a big reduction in concussions. The problem is now we're starting to see these guys take the ball out from nine yards deep in the end zone, eight yards deep in the end zone, because it is a, a difference making play. We've got some dynamic athletes out there as return guys. So there's a balance that they have to strike, changing the rules to the point where you take away the integrity of the game, but you're always trying to make the game safer. Uh, moving the kickoff up five yards, taking the wedge of four man, and making it only a two-man wedge. Um, you know, not allowing the guys to take big runs down the field. You have to have one foot five yards from the ball. We used to have guys that were coming from 20 yards deep. They'd loop all the way down. They'd hit that, that kickoff point in full stride, full speed. So the NFL continues to look at the plays where they're having their issues with the concussions and make modifications during the offseason. It will be interesting to see what happens this year because some positive results have come out. The only area that there was an increase in concussions last season in the NFL was the contact of the helmet to the ground. And the NFL has had a game day standards committee for about four years now that looks at the synthetic and the natural surfaces in the NFL and what role are they playing. So I, I, would, be, I would not be surprised to see them come out this year and, and move some way in that direction. But all these positive things are trickling down to the younger levels. We have heads up tackling. Uh, which is something that you can get certified in. You can have people come and teach your kids how to tackle the right way, which is taking the head out of the tackle. You know, we were always head forward. Now we're head back, arms and shoulder forward with heads up tackling. So we're trying to minimize that contact. Uh, I was at a seminar recently. I saw Kevin Guskowitz talk about behavior modification. And there was a boy who was getting concussions the exact same way every time. He was a wedge buster. And he had had four of them already doing the same thing. So they took the film. They showed him on film what he was doing wrong, retaught him the technique, and he hasn't had a concussion since. So if you become a repeat offender, you're getting injured in the same way. There's behavioral modifications that the coaches are implementing now. So there's been a lot of advancements being made. Uh, the one thing that people have to know, and this comes from my college coach who got it from Duffy Doherty, uh, who is a head coach at Michigan State. Um, football is not a contact sport. It's a game of collisions. And he would always say, if you want to take up a contact sport, go do ballroom dancing. So let's contact the ballroom dancing. <laughs> this is a collision sport. So we are never going to get rid of the concussion from the game of football. Thank you for mentioning soccer. Because soccer is number two. And soccer flies under the radar. Because there are no pads and there is no collision. But there's a number of girls whose soccer careers are being shut down at an early age because of TBI issues. Uh, this is a problem that is a part of life as an athlete and an active child. I had four concussions before I was 13. Three of the four knocked out cold, just being a boy, falling off a bike, falling out of a tree, silly things that you're not going to avoid. I had three as an NFL and a collegiate football player and never lost consciousness. So my worst concussions were just as a boy growing up. It's a part of an active lifestyle. It's a part of an athletic background. They're going to be there. Just like you said, you've got soldiers carrying four concussions, seven concussions into their military career. Active childs, athletic childs, uh, you're going to have this issue. So the great thing about this seminar is this is not about Morgan in the military or Daryl in the, in, the, in the football league, the NFL. This is about everybody. 
because the most common cause of the concussion is, is the accident, the fall. That's what mm -hmm. our emergency room has. That's a regular mom and dad. That's not the mom and dad of a military man. That's not the mom and dad of an athletic child. That's the mom and dad of a six-year-old mm -hmm. boy who fell out of a tree. I want to get back to the kids in a minute, but um, what's, the, what's the talk in the locker room, the, foot, the NFL locker rooms? How are the players uh, accepting the changes and what's going on? Some will resist. Um, you know, we've seen James Harrison continue to get six-figure fines because he will not play by the new rules that are there. Um, we had Heinz Ward call out Ben Roethlisberger uh, for not playing the following week because he had a concussion the week before. There's a new system in place in the NFL. And we're kind of through that transitional phase where the guys who are under the old regime and the old style aren't there anymore. And it's the new generation that are much smarter, um, much more open to change. Mm -hmm. We've got to change the culture. We have to change the conversation. Just what Morgan said. Don't call it treatment, don't call it therapy. <laughs> call it training performance, enhancement, anything you want, something positive. Um, our bosses at Fox, in one of our seminars, when this first became a hot button topic, do not use the terms he got his bell rung, and do not use the term he got dinged. This is a serious issue. If you see somebody that's hurt and he stumbles as he goes to gain his footing, don't laugh, don't make jokes about it. This is serious stuff. So we're in the process now of, of moving through this, but it's gonna take a long time. Uh, because it's going to be a cultural change, a conversational change, and then getting the guys to buy into it and setting the example on Sunday afternoons for the kids on Saturday afternoons and the kids on Friday nights to follow. Mm -hmm. okay. um, that's it. Uh, to segue into uh, protecting children, um, I'll show this to the panel first, but um, I, I don't know if you've seen this. It's uh, the Atlantic cover. It's called The Overprotected Kid, and he's wearing a helmet and shin guards, and he's got pillows tied to his front and back. So... <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Lori, and then please anybody jump in. But um, how do we? How do you talk to parents um, and to the children themselves? How do you keep a balance uh, between uh, protecting children? I mean, traumatic brain injury is a terrible thing. How do you keep a balance between protecting them and just letting a kid be a kid? Right. That's <laughs> that is the golden question right now. And you know, this is a this is a tough thing because, as Daryl said. Uh, the language is already really changing. I mean, you'll notice now if you hear stories about concussion, even the term concussion is being used less and less, but they're actually saying a mild brain injury. It is a brain injury. It is something to be taken seriously. But at the same time, it is very important to remember, you know, those of us who work in brain research, I tell the families I work with all the time, this is such an exciting time to be doing this kind of research because so much of the news about the brain's potential even an injury is so promising and exciting. And we want parents to realize that. Uh, truly, the benefits of participating in sports, especially for a young person, and I work a lot with adolescents, with teens, there's so many important changes going on in their brain during this time, but also all these other things that we want to promote for them, whether it be the social aspects, the camaraderie, um, certainly being exposed to some important <laughs> good role models and mentors, the physical activity. I mean, we could go on and on about the benefits of sports. And, and yet so many people are really choosing to glom over that um, and, and move more in this direction of, of fear or gloom and doom. And it, and it really doesn't need to be that way. Uh, in fact, with these mild brain injuries that are sustained, especially in these uh, sports or recreation related instances, uh, you can absolutely overcome you know, these. and, and potentially be able to reverse any long-term effects as well. So it's very important that we, that we help the folks realize, firstly, how importantly it is to manage them when they happen so that we don't incur the potential for more long-term or persistent effects, but then to also realize that as we keep monitoring, should we see some problems emerge later, we can absolutely be vigilant, be proactive um, to handle those and make some positive changes for those young people. Well, here's a liberal arts major who's going to argue with the doctor. But I would argue if you think the science of the brain is where the science of the heart or the lungs or any other part of your body is, you're wrong. It's not. And we really don't know these answers yet. We don't know what long-term repetitive concussions can cause over a lifetime. We, we really don't. And that's really where we need to get. Yeah. And that's, that's what bothers me. If somehow we as a society have accepted where we are right now, and where we are is not where we need to be. You know, I came at this because of military concussions. 
DOD has said they have done 265,000 diagnoses of concussion since the war started on 911. 265,000. 80% of those happened in training accidents and before they ever deployed. 20% of them were done downrange. 3.4 million Americans every single year have head trauma. 3.4 million Americans are the new CDC numbers. At a direct cost of $78 billion. Yet we spent last year $82 million on TBI research. $82 million. Now, there's a lot of businessmen out here, so I can relate to you. If you had a $78 billion problem in your business, and your R&D budget to fix it was $82 million, you wouldn't be CEO for very long. You just wouldn't. It is the leading cause of death and injury in adults under the age of 45, according to the CDC. So this is a huge, huge issue here that we're just starting to see. And it's not just football players. It's, it's, it's not just those who serve in the military. It, it is across our society. And we don't know what the second and third order effects are. And that's what really concerns me. Yeah, and I think one of the big reasons we don't know is there aren't any good monitoring systems in place. I mean, so many families share the stories. It, for one, and we're lucky if they make it to the emergency room or, or see a medical professional. Thankfully, that's changing now. Um, and now all 50 states have passed what originally started as the Zachary Leistat Law in Washington State. And now, certainly, we know that in the the school settings that if an individual has a concussion they have to take them out they can't return to play until they have been cleared by a licensed medical professional so thankfully the identification aspect has vastly improved uh, of late and i think even the folks on the sidelines are doing a much better job of that um, but what happens once they're discharged once they're sent home once we need to get them back into school for example and that's where folks are really falling falling through the cracks so where we really need to be able to build our research uh, is in this idea of long-term monitoring keeping keeping tabs on these kiddos so that we can make those connections and certainly if again if we do see anything happen be able to intervene right away yeah we're not where we need to be but we sure are a lot further along than we were just a few years ago and that's the the positive thing for me and and it's really the center for brain health that 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 was their promise to me, to get my baseline at 44 after playing 11 years in the NFL, five years of Division I football, knowing I had a number of really serious concussions as a boy, there's some hesitancy to go through the diagnosis process. You need somebody to tell you, if you get bad news, we're going to be there to help you. We're going to have an individualized plan for you to work you through this. And you go in and you get your evaluation. Now I have to go. Just like I check my prostate, check my colon, I get my brain checked. Every three years I go back in. This is something that I'm going to continue to do. And I hope to be part of a long-term study. And is it the repetitive concussion, the small hits at the line of scrimmage, or is that one big hit that you took maybe twice in your entire career out in the open field? Which one is it? Which one is more dangerous? These are things we don't know, but at least we're finally starting to look at them. Yeah. And that's, what, that's where we are right now. I mean, there's so much more positive things going on out there. And, and I agree with Dr. Cook. The, the biggest thing for me, people ask me this, would you go back and do it again? Absolutely, in a heartbeat. I love the game of football, but the game of football gave me my life. I met my wife in Dallas because I was in Dallas playing football. I have two great kids with my wife because of the game of football. That's the path that it took me mm -hmm. on. I want to claim the ladder of life, right? I'm, I'm not going to hide. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to live this life to the fullest, and I have confidence that we're going to move down the path in the right way. Yeah. Well, uh, you brought up the tests you take, and I, uh, uh, James Glassman, you mentioned Michael King, Kinsley's story, uh, and part of it, Michael Kinsley had uh, Parkinson has Parkinson's disease, and he wrote in the New Yorker about these cognitive tests that that he took, and then um, sort of compared it to his own. Uh, analysis of this brain that's in his own head and so it made you sort of question well you know he gives credibility to these cognitive tests that he's getting but he also it makes you wonder uh, do we need better testing and what kind of testing is there and so I want to throw um, throw that out to what kinds of tools do we need uh, what do we have? Where does it fall short? And where can it be better to, uh, to uh, get a good diagnosis for uh, traumatic brain injury? I, I would argue what we need to do is understand the biology more than we understand it today. Okay? We, in, 2000, in the year 2000, I'm at, you know, here's where I get in trouble with all my psychiatrist friends. The APA published what was called DSM-IV. 
the DSM-4 lists 17 questions that you were to ask somebody, um, licensed professional was, um, to make a determination and a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress. In 2013, they published DSM-5. They added three questions. Three questions. Now that's after the Army alone and DOD spending $600 million on post-traumatic stress research. We got three more questions in DSM-5. We have to understand the biology. If you were to go into a doctor and say, Doc, I broke my leg, and the doctor was to look at you and say, well, let me ask you 17 questions, and I'll tell you at the end of those 17 questions where well, your leg is broken. He said, no, your leg's not broken. You would go, wait a second. Where's the x-ray? Where is the exam? Where is the something that will tell us definitively this pain I'm feeling isn't a broken leg? We're in the same position we are with mild and moderate traumatic brain injury with Glasgow coma. It is a cognitive test that's given at the time of injury, and we make a determination whether somebody has mild, moderate, or severe. We need blood biomarkers. We need imaging. Those are the things we need so that we really have diagnostics. We read a newspaper article about this kid did this, and he had post-traumatic stress, and we, we equate that to almost he had a broken leg. If, the, if somebody said he had post-traumatic stress, he had post-traumatic stress, but we really don't know that. Some of the people we are treating with post-traumatic stress, there's no doubt in my mind, and I think most people's mind, he have some form of depression, possibly some form of, of bipolar. You know, we don't know because we don't have good biological diagnostics that are accepted by the FDA as a standard of care that when you go into the doctor, this is what they're going to use to make a diagnosis. We don't have them. And that's, what I, that's what, where I think we have got to get. And then all this becomes a lot clearer as we move down this road. So, so let me build upon your comments there. Um, so if we compare the brain right, to every other organ in the body, right? so the, the brain's unlike every other organ in the body. It's continuously adapting. You're continuously learning. Right? Every you know, millisecond of time that, that passes by, all of the circuits in your brain, you know, they're, they're changing how they interact with each other. And, you know, the way that we've been talking about the brain today has been, uh, you know, from a thousand feet away, that you hope to get a brain scan or you hope to, you know, have some diagnostic, you know, questionnaire or something like that. And, you know, obviously that's not the right path, right? We need that very fine resolution so that we can observe those processes, right? And, those, and when I say observe those processes, I mean throughout every aspect of your life, right? In everyday life, you would like to understand how those circuits are, are responding. And, you know, getting back to the heart analogy, right? So if you have a heart problem, you can go to your physician, they'll strap a monitor on you, they'll record your heartbeats, right? Every second for a month at a time, you can come back and give that information to your physician, they can respond to it. We don't have the same kind of technology for the brain. And uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why DARPA is also uh, in, in this area, is because we want to build those kinds of technologies uh, to enable that level of granularity. What's it going to take to get there, and what's yeah. it going to look like? Um, so so uh, there is hope in, in, in this regard. So uh, has anybody heard of deep brain stimulators for Parkinson's but, yeah. disease? Right. So you know, there are over 100,000 people that already have brain implants, right? Electrodes that are in the brain, tiny pacemakers that are implanted in the chest where you're interacting with the brain uh, in order to ameliorate the, the symptoms of, of those disorders. Uh, now, while those devices are just stimulating the brain, the next generation of those kind of devices will have the ability to not only stimulate, but also sense from the brain, and then use that sensing information to make intelligent decisions about how to interact with the brain. So I, you know, I really think that's where we're going to see the inroads to this, and that field is only going to, to grow in, in the future. But also, if you had that heart problem, an old guy like me, and he has chest pains, one of the first things they're going to do is take my blood. And based on the presence or not presence of troponin, they're going to make a determination I had bad liquidity or I had heart attack. <laughs> so, so my point here is that's what we really need to understand. Now, GFAP and S100 beta have been in the literature for 10 to 15 years as being something we could possibly put on the football field, okay, if we had an assay, and rather than use a cognitive test where you're asking some guy, how many fingers am I holding up, literally do a, bi a biological test to see if they have had a concussive event because these two proteins seem to show up in the blood after, at least that's what some of the literature says, that's where we need to get to. And we need to do the large-scale science where people are sharing data, okay, to get us to that point. So we don't leave it up, you know, to the person asking questions uh, or answering questions. We leave it up to no kidding biology 
that we can understand and say, yes, this person has suffered a concussive event. And wouldn't that be a wonderful thing on a, on a, on a high school soccer field or, or anywhere with a single drop of blood in a short period of time with a simple test be able to make a determination whether, in my case, my granddaughter should, should, should go seek further treatment? Yeah, that sounds like the holy grail. Um, just to change the subject a little bit, I've already learned on this panel not to use the word treatment, not to use the word therapy, never say your bell has been rung, and don't say <laughs> you've been, don't say, and don't say dinged, and I was, I was going to say that myself. And <laughs> I've also very much noticed that, uh, General Corelli, you don't say post-traumatic stress disorder, you cut it off at post-traumatic stress. And, uh, all of these words, phrases are stigmatizing. And tell me, tell me your thinking behind that and behind stigma. And then, Morgan, I'd like to hear your. Uh, uh, I don't know if this room can handle us. what I would have to say about that. But <laughs> well, you know, Morgan's really not the right one to answer because he went in and got help. He, he what, okay, whatever yeah, he did, yeah. he went in and got help. Mm -hmm. I'm worried about the person who won't go in and get the help mm -hmm. that is so stigmatized by it, and they don't want to be told that they have a disorder. Now, when I'm making this argument, I say, I'm not going to talk about soldiers because that's a bad analogy. Let's talk about women who were sexually assaulted. S the literature says 72% of women who were sexually assaulted have developed post-traumatic stress. I find it absolutely offensive that you would go up to a woman who's been violently sexually assaulted, who has a problem with relationships immediately following that from post-traumatic stress and say, you have post-traumatic stress <laughs> disorder. That's not disorder, and I think the biology is pointing to the fact that there is an injury that takes place. There is something, this comorbidity, that we're seeing with blast injury and post-traumatic stress. And, and I, I am doing it, and I'm trying to get other people to do it, not from the standpoint of helping those that are already getting help, but helping those that are out there treating their symptoms with alcohol, drug abuse, polypharmacy, those kind of things that aren't going to the Center for Brain Health, who aren't coming in and getting help for the problem that mm -hmm. they have. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know any of the 19 to 25 year old kids that I worked with that wanted to be told they had a disorder. When I was 19, I was Superman. I could do anything and I didn't have disorders. And that's the problem that many of these kids have today. Yeah. I, I agree with the general. I, I don't want to label, I, especially with something that is such a negative label as a disorder. I mean, it, it, since I was a kid growing up, everybody's like, you are hyperactive, you have hyperactive, hyperactive disorder, or you have something else is wrong with you. Quit doing that. Now, I grew up on a, I grew up on a dirt road on a horse ranch in Willis, Texas. I was the average kid. I was the guy that they said, well, we're surprised you graduated high school, but don't go to college. Well, we're surprised that you graduated college, but by all means, don't go into the Navy and try to become a Navy SEAL. I was that guy. And amazingly, when I became a Navy SEAL, they were like, oh, well, you're that guy. That's why you can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> the reason you don't have post-traumatic stress is because you're a Navy SEAL. The reason you can get over your TBI is because you're a Navy SEAL. That's crap. I look, when right now, when I'm looking out into this crowd, I see a group of my peers that chose different career paths than me. I'm no different than anybody else. That's, that's the gift that we all have. We can do anything we want. Society puts a finger on us and says, no, absolutely not. You need to do this because you're a woman. You need to do this. You're a man. You're from Texas. You're from, you need to play football. Those things. So again, I agree with the general in saying, don't, don't saddle me with a, a label of a, as a disorder. There's absolutely nothing wrong with me. I'll argue with you that every day. I failed all those tests. Those post-traumatic stress tests, I failed. I mean, number one, right out of the shoot, the guy doctor's like, Wow, you, 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 you may have something. Well, no, I don't. I promise you I don't. I, think I get I, fired up. I mean, I get excited, but I'm, I'm excited because I'm talking about something that I'm, that I'm passionate about. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that if, if you were to, to talk to any of his teammates and anybody in the military, and, and us to a much, much lesser degree, we, we, we all want to be like Morgan Luttrell as athletes. We, we all want to have that camaraderie with our squad. We don't like being told things we can't do, number one. If you tell us that, we're going to show you that we can. And we hate to lose more than we like to win. So you're kind of brought from that same steel, that same foundational thing. And, and that's how we get to where we are. And, and that's why we didn't tell people when we knew we had a concussion. Because we didn't want to let our teammates down. 
I'm supposed to do this job. Don't tell me I can't do it because I'm fine. I may be a little off right now, but I'm good. And that's the way that it was talked about. That's why the how change you, in the conversation. How do you look at that now? It's, it's changing, and it's changing for the better. And it was a sign of weakness to leave the game because of a concussion back in the day. Um, you were expected to play through because you could still walk. Now, a, a sprained ankle? Well, well now, yeah, you, could, you can take a week or so and get that better and get back on the field. <laughs> but a concussion? You need to get back out there. And I've heard stories where the trainers actually went to the guys because they had certain numbers that they would give. Who are you going to test? I'm going to test Scott. Give Scott four. He usually says four. They got to that point so you could get the guys back onto the field. So people have to understand the amount of change in the culture of athletics that you're trying to create and really how, how far you've come already. They're starting to embrace it. The guys are starting to understand it. And, and it will continue to happen as the kids continue to play the sports moving up in this new environment. That, that this is a little bit more serious than was thought by your dad, by your older brother. I have something to add and yeah, to that. To speak. The reason I ended up getting help is because I eventually was in charge. I became a platoon commander in charge of my men. And in order to do what we all needed to do, I needed to do what I needed to do. And if I didn't have the capabilities because my mind was not focusing right, it doesn't matter what happened to me. If my men get hurt, there's no sense of me coming home because I was overall responsible for them. That's why I ended up going to the Center for Brain Health and getting treatment and getting lined back out because when we're out doing the things that we do, there is, it's just an overwhelming in and out of, of information. I have, to get into the weeds, I, I got a radio on both ears. I have somebody else with two more radios talking to me, telling me something, I have acid, I have airplanes overhead that if I need them to drop something, in order to save my life or my men's life, I have to make sure that every single thing is lined up. And that can be very overwhelming. I heard earlier they said that a 25-year-old will take everything on board and an older individual will systematically pick the pieces that they need to understand. Well, you have to teach somebody to do that. That's not something that you're innately born with. A lot of the gifted people, maybe. But this guy right here, no. Okay, I need a training. I need a training. And I was at 39 years old at the time. I was the guy that was taking everything in because I think I, I thought I needed to know everything because I, the, the worst thing, and to pick what Daryl was saying, I don't want anybody to go out and do something without me. Those are my guys. And my, my teammates thought the same way. You're not going out there without me because if anything happens, I want to be there, period. I don't care if I'm dragging a leg, if I have a head injury, if I can't see, that's okay. Just tell me which way to shoot. Something along those lines. That's the... That's the camaraderie and the, team, the teamwork and just the brotherhood that we have that, that, that keeps us alive. We're not going anywhere without each other. And I had to force my guys, like, take a break. You're not going. I had to force to tell them. I'll lock you up, but you're not going out the door with me. And it, it takes that. And that's a beautiful thing. That is an amazing thing to have in, in a group of people. That sounds like, you know, sort of by example and you going on to... Um get training. <laughs> um, it, it, that sounds like a good way to um, decrease stigma while still getting the word out. But I'm wondering if, if anybody can think of any strategies for raising awareness about traumatic brain injury um, without uh, uh, simultaneously sort of increasing stigma, but rather reducing it. Yeah, I'm happy to take that one because I, I see it in teens all the time. Um, there hasn't been a single teenager that I've had to pull their leg or their parents have had to drag them into us to get help. I think for the most part, especially the teen athletes I've worked with, these are high performers. You know, typically they have done very well in school, honor roll students at the top of their game sports wise, and now, you know, feel like they're just not. Um, and academically, and they want to be back up where they were. And they get frustrated because it's so true. A lot of the testing that can be done, especially in the school level, might say, well, you're, you're right in the middle of the average range. And they tell me, oh, I was not average before. And I'm very frustrated <laughs> by that. I want to get back up to where I was before. And so 
One thing we really love about the work that we do at the Center for Brain Health with the SMART program, which is, you know, what Morgan went through, I do something very similar with our teenagers, and it's all about really empowering them to do this, empowering them to, to reach those higher levels of brain performance that, that they're capable of. And I think it means a lot um, for teens to talk to other teens about that, mm -hmm. to let them know. I think when it comes to spreading awareness and reducing the stigma, um, to hear to hear from themselves, to mm -hmm. hear from folks who've been through it, just like them, can really make a big difference. You know, Daryl said that things are getting a lot better, and I'm the biggest fan of the commissioner and what he's done in the NFL. I think the NFL has put a protocol in place that is, at the, you know, at, at the top of the science that we know right now. Not only do they use impact and impact testing and hold players out, but you know they have spotters um, that are that are up in the up in the boxes who are looking for people who who have had trauma uh, on the field that may not be reported. They call those folks out, they bring them in, they get them tested right there on the field. But, you know, that's not the same in NCAA. The NCAA does not have a protocol. It's basically left up to the individual schools and the conferences to go ahead and make a determination of the protocol they're going to follow. We put a protocol in place even before the NFL downrange in Iraq and Afghanistan, thanks to Jim Kelly and others who came together and helped us to put together a protocol that said, when we suspect and a concussive event is taking place, this is, this is what's going to happen, and it's going to happen the same way every single time. We need to force that from the, from the NFL down through the NCAA, and I think into our youth programs, so that we have the same kind of standards down there, and I think we as parents and grandparents have to be the ones that, that in fact, make that happen. Um, that's where the science is taking us. And that's not to scare people, that's just to be, to take the proper precautions when you think somebody may have suffered one of these injuries. Because I don't think there's anybody who agrees that successive concussions on top of concussions, when you have not given the body the time to, to heal, are, are, are not harmful. I think we all agree that if you have a concussion on Tuesday and you're back in doing the same thing on Thursday and have another concussion, that is a recipe for disaster. And one of the, the good things that's happening at the, at the lower levels is they're taking that decision from the, the coach, trainer, player, and they've got those independent people now that are going out into the rural areas and making that decision. I mean, what happens in the state of Texas on Friday night when the starting quarterback goes down in week 10, you qualify for the first round of the state playoffs. Well, he had a concussion last week and he's not ready to go but we have to have them. It's the first round of the playoffs. Those are the decisions that we're starting to see people without a vested interest in that game make for the benefit yeah. of the, of the yeah. child and the player that was involved. So yeah. that, that's one of the really unique things that's coming out of the lower level that, that's very, very beneficial. And, and as a Seattle fan, we weren't very happy when Percy Harden <laughs> missed the NFC Championship game because he was in the second week of, of what they thought was gonna be three weeks of you know, being down for a concussion. Mm -hmm. But that that happened, Okay, and that we won the Super Bowl with, without him being in the NFC uh, championship. That's, 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 that's a huge statement for the NFL and what yeah. they're doing. Yeah. And, the, and the fans accepted that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we're just about getting ready for questions. While well, people maybe make their way to the mic, uh, I'm going to end with one last question, which is the way in 35 years as a reporter I've always ended, ended interviews, which is to say, is there anything any of you is dying to say that, that I haven't thought of to ask you or that we haven't covered yet? One thing. Okay. This is the toughest problem of the human body, by far. And to compare it with any other organ, I think, is a huge mistake. The heart is a pump. It's relatively a difficult and a complicated pump, but its sole purpose <laughs> in life is to pump blood to the brain. The brain is tough, and until we start sharing data, until we start collecting data using common data elements and force researchers, once they get together and make a determination what those data elements should be, given our ability to be able to analyze data in a ways that we've never been able to do it before, that is when I really believe, although it's not a panacea, but that's when I really believe we're going to be able to get at this issue. And there's going to have to be a whole bunch of structural and other changes that are going to have to take place. But we're going to continue having all these little puzzle pieces out there but no one's allowed to put together the pieces to see what the entire picture is. Okay. Okay, well, let's start, uh, let's start taking questions then. And please give your name. We can hear you. There we go. Okay. 
Hi, I'm Carrie Sheridan. I'm a reporter with AFP News in Washington. And I have two questions. One for Dr. Sanchez. It's so rare to get to speak to somebody from DARPA. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about the stage uh, that you're at in the research of getting people to recognize loved ones again. What's the, where are you with that? Have you seen any success in people yet and things like that? And uh, for Morgan, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the sort of training that you've done that's had some success for you. What were the techniques and, and how did it work? Thank you. So uh, the question uh, was about the uh, memory restoration. So uh, this in particular is uh, uh, related to our RAM programs called Restoring Active Memory. Again, it's uh, one of the programs from DARPA in support of the President's Brain Initiative. Um, this program um, was just announced uh, around the holiday season, you know, the, the just past holiday season. And we have gone through the process of selecting um, some people to work on that project. And uh, we are, are ramping up towards a kickoff of that program uh, over the next uh, few months here. So uh, we hope to be making an announcement on who will actually be working on that project and then uh, share some uh, great results uh, short after, shortly after that. But you haven't actually had someone who lost memory. Not, a, not at this point. Not at this point. Right. So right now we're defining the science as well as the techniques that we will uh, use to deliver that, that type of clinical therapy. And uh, we've got some great ideas that came back to the agency and we have some of the most talented scientists in our country that will be working on this project. So again, stay tuned. Uh, lots of exciting things will be coming in the very near future. Do you have any kind of rough timeline? Uh, yeah, so uh, this project runs for four years. Um, so you know, starting the clock from now, you know, we hope to have some uh, really big wins in the area of memory recovery within the first year. Uh, you know, we, we take the responsibility of trying to uh, deliver upon the president's initiative extremely seriously. I mean, this is a huge responsibility, uh, not only for our military personnel, but for the American public as a whole. If we don't crack some of these problems, you know, this is a missed opportunity. So that's why we're pushing as, as hard as we can to get up and running as fast as we can. Okay, yeah. Some of your oh. treatments. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, so I attended the SMART pro program at the Center for Brain Health, and I'm going to use an analogy to kind of break it down so it, it, it makes me more comfortable to talk that way so everybody can kind of understand where I'm coming from. Okay, so uh, the SMART program is a systematic way of taking on your day to day activity when, with guys like me, everything was so overwhelming. So when I put this in association, I was like, this is how I make reference. Imagine a Rubik's Cube. Everybody knows in the room what knows what a Rubik's Cube is, correct? So if someone was to throw me a Rubik's Cube in the past and, and say, solve it, I would look at this cube because there's 43 quintillion ways <laughs> to solve this thing, really. That the mathematical equation puts that out. I, I, I can't get my head around that. I have no idea what that means. And I have no idea how to approach that and solve that problem. Well, before I went to the SMART program, it was my day-to-day -day was I was having trouble solving the day-to-day, -day, my day-to-day -day life. So imagine this. At, when, this, when I joined the SMART program, they systematically broke down and taught me ways to integrate my life. So if I took a Rubik's Cube and I said, don't worry about solving a Rubik's Cube like this, what if I taught you an algorithm or a systematic way to solve the Rubik's Cube. Instead of worrying about the whole cube, just solve the top part. Okay, so I wake up in the morning and it's like, where's the elephant in the room for me? What, what is plaguing my day? And concentrate on that. So I concentrate on one thing. Just like with the Rubik's Cube, I concentrate on solving the top row. Okay? And then next, the strategic thinking. Let's solve, what's, what's next for Morgan? All right, well, let's solve the second row in the Rubik's Cube. And the brain health and the SMART program teaches me, taught me, and will teach, you can teach anyone, a systematic way, not only, i.e., to solve a Rubik's Cube, basically, because the end game is all the same. What do you want to get out of your day? I want to get through it. And I want to make sure that I accomplish every single one of my goals. Okay, it's just like with the Rubik's Cube. What do you want to do? You want to solve it. So if, I, if they can teach you how to get through your day, just like I can teach you how to solve a Rubik's Cube in 20 moves, the end game's the same. Everybody tracking? <laughs> Did that answer your question? Thank you. Yes? Hi, 
I'm Dr. Shereen Adebaki. I'm a researcher and emergency medicine trauma physician here at Children's National in uh, D.C. Uh, thank you for, for, this, uh, uh, for your wonderful work and uh, bringing recognition to concussion. Uh, there is a concussion crisis in America today. Uh, you talked about uh, emergency department patients. You know, there are actually over five million individuals with concussion coming to, with TBI, coming to emergency departments annually in the United States. And that is the tip of the iceberg because we're not screening for this disease. Zero percent of emergency departments have concussion diagnostic or screening tools. What we're doing is managing these children with CAT scans and causing iatrogenic injury and adults as well, but especially for the children. Um, and Daryl, you know, the work you've done is wonderful because professional athletes say the biggest gift they've given to children with this disease, you know, the best positive thing that's come out of it is to bring recognition to it, bring recognition to this issue. How do we address this? How do we change this mindset um, to allow for just basic, even public health measures like basic screening and uh, understanding of this disease? Um, how do we do it? How do we go from that 83 million funding for uh, uh, 83 million funding for a 83 billion dollar problem? How do we change that paradigm? I'll tell you why I'm not the medical icon. Um, doctors are stigmatized by this as anybody is, and I, and I found that. I, I had people uh, come and we would do tests on vehicles to see what 30 pounds of explosives under the front wheel would do to the individuals inside. Uh, these were very, you know. These were using crash dummies like even better than are used by Detroit to understand the injuries that would occur when you, when you had the people in a vehicle go through something like that. And people would brief out to me, these three people died, and they'd be able to tell me exactly what, why they died. This guy had a broken femur, busted his aorta, he bled out, and bomb, bomb, bomb. These three people had some kind of spinal cord injury, and these three people got out and walked out the back of the vehicle. And I would say to the docs, I'd say, okay, how many of them had a concussion? And they say, well, we don't know. I said, well, are you measuring anything? Are you doing anything to see, you know, what kind of pressures occur here and what we can expect of these people? No, we're not doing anything because, you know, we can't, we can't see those. We, we, one of the things we have to do is we have to educate the medical profession and, and get folks to really understand the issues here. I've had emergency room doctors tell me the easiest patients to clear out of the emergency room on a very, very busy day are the ones with concussions because they're not bleeding, they seem okay, you know, they're reporting a little dizziness or the, you know, the symptoms, but let's get them out of there because we've got really sick people in here that are, that are injured. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but I've had them tell me that. Um, so, so I really believe a lot has to be done to educate everybody about this and ensure that everyone is getting the care that they need. And I think it's so challenging because it's so specific to the individual, too. Um, you know, how come he's had, you know, upwards of seven to nine concussions and, and he seems fine and he's only had two and we can't get him back onto the field? Mm -hmm. um, I saw a video that a gentleman presented at one of the symposiums and it was Jason Witten. Uh, years ago, I don't know if anybody remembers the game against the Philadelphia Eagles when he was hit so hard that his helmet came off and he continued down the field. Well, they actually were able to freeze one of the frames and the distortion in his face and the tackler's face and the shapes of their helmet were unbelievable. And he spun out, went down the field, and there was, there was not even a test on the sideline to see if he had a concussion. He perfectly fine. And the following season, he's trying to split through two defenders, turns his shoulders, and falls in just a little tap on the back of the head, and he's walking to the opposite sideline. He doesn't even know where he's at. He's kind of out on his feet. So how can he sustain a hit that the people in the room estimated to be 155, 160 Gs of force to one that's 30 Gs of force, and yet the 30 Gs of force on the back of the head did more to a TBI than the 165 Gs to the front of the head? So uh, it, it, it's, it's such a tough thing, and, and, I, and I think the general is right because we can't see it. And that was the whole thing you know, as an athlete with the ankle and the knee, if it's a broken bone, if it's if something I can see, I understand why you can't play. I can see the swelling, I can see the instability. I can't see this, so why aren't you out there? There doesn't seem to be anything wrong with you. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of the pressure came from. Well, and if I may, really quick, I'm so glad we've got representation from, from Children's National here because you guys have some incredible, you know, concussion programs, especially for facilitating that connection that so often just doesn't happen between 
discharging from the hospital back into the school and just even putting tools in the parents' hands. What do I do if I think my child had a concussion? I appreciate that some of the advice you put out there is even, well, go ahead and call your pediatrician and tell them what happened and, and go ahead and ask if they should be seen by you or should we go ahead and take them into the emergency department? I think more than anything, the parents just need some ideas for what to do should this ever happen because right now I think most of them are just at a loss. And so oftentimes maybe choose to do nothing at all and I think that's why we're missing so many. Okay. Oh. So for the general, so how do we go? So what you're talking about is knowledge translation. How do we go to getting the funding and support and interest in doing this knowledge translation back to your eighty three million to eighty three well, I, I think the first thing we have to do is understand why we've spent $700 million and have gotten as little out of it as we are right now. I mean, Secretary McHugh indicated the United States Army, and I was part of the spending of that money. I didn't understand the research system. I didn't understand that you fund $500,000 and $1 million projects at a whole bunch of different places. They collect data, have data. They don't necessarily collect it the same way. And then once they have that data, that data belongs to them in the university, and they keep that data. And that data is used for the next grant down the road. To me, what has to happen here is we've got to say, we've got to kind of have to do what we did with AIDS. You know, there was a magical day in this country when everybody decided, when Magic Johnson came out and said, I have AIDS, that every male in America said, holy cow, this thing is really serious. I was over in Europe at the time, and I remember getting the calls about AIDS is a real huge problem. And a whole bunch of moms got really, really mad. The problem with military folks is, we basically cut out a piece of cardboard and say, okay, I'm a, I'm a vet, give me a couple of bucks. They, these moms got really, really mad. They went up to Congress. They made blankets they stretched across the mall. And the Congress decided to put together a public-private partnership of people who got together shared data, and it included researchers, scientists, and everyone. They identified the virus, and then they went on in their own way. They snapped the chalk line. Some people made the five-year drug, the 10-year drug, the 20-year drug. And now we're almost to the point where somebody comes and says, you have AIDS, but you're going to die of something else. That was done in 26 years. We went from not even understanding what was causing it to being able to get to where we are today. I mean, there's been two articles I've seen in the paper where they've claimed cures. And for doctors to use the word cure is almost, you know, doctors don't like that word. But they've, they've claimed two cures of people with AIDS. I, I really wish we had learned from that experience and applied it to some of these very difficult problems we have here. Um, you heard the numbers for Alzheimer's, and I think they're all connected. And, and to me, we really need to look at the system and say, how, not only, we're not spending enough, but even what we're spending isn't getting us down the road. What do we have to do differently? OK, now I'm sorry to keep you waiting. <laughs> My name is Emily Underwood. I'm a reporter uh, with Science Magazine. I cover neuroscience. Um, I have two questions. One is for Dr. Sanchez about deep brain stimulation. It has been proven it's effective for Parkinson's, but there have been a number of recent clinical trials that have been shut down for other conditions. Can you be a little more specific about what DARPA hopes to explore with deep, deep brain stimulation? Sure. Um, my second question is um, about the patient populations with TBI who haven't really been addressed here, um, the homeless, huge rates of TBI, prison inmates, also huge rates, domestic, victims of domestic violence, both adults and kids. Can you talk about how translating this work into um, to beyond um, athletes in the military? So for the first question about uh, DBS, so why has DBS failed in, in some uh, regard? Uh, our perspective on that is because the, the way that DBS is being delivered is not really in tune for the brain. So a little history lesson here. DBS uh, really came out of the cardiac pacemaker world. And uh, if you think about it, those same kind of stimulators are being you know, rerouted to the brain. And you know, in very simple terms, you're just pulsing the brain in a non-intelligent way. And uh, you know, that, again, that doesn't really uh, tap into understanding the circuitry of the brain and understanding how the brain adapts right, to therapies or adapts to different situations. So um, the, the unique perspective that DARPA has on this problem is that let's do deep brain stimulation 
uh, using knowledge as our, as our fundamental way of interacting with the brain. Let's deliver precise therapeutic interventions that operate in closed loop, meaning that we respond immediately depending upon the measurements that we make from the brain. And given those observations and immediate feedback that we're giving to the brain, can we tailor the therapy to every individual's uh, condition? Uh, so, so that's how we're going to change the world on this one. We're going to take this uh, you know, from trial and error into the domain of knowledge-driven therapy back for the brain. And does anybody on the panel want to address the second well, question? Well, there's, there's, there's one traumatic brain injury that just failed. It was called the PROTECT test, and it was on progesterone. For the longest period of time, progesterone has been seen as uh, possibly being something that if administered uh, intravenously within six hours of traumatic brain injury, um, that it, it, it has an effect, a positive effect in, in recovery uh, for people. And it took, I think, eight to 12 years to finally get to phase three trials because progesterone by the time it was seen was already a generic drug and no one's gonna put any money into a generic drug to repurpose it in that way so it could be used for TBI. But even though, um, I, and I don't know all the details, but it, it, the, the test had to be abandoned because of futility. And the futility is that the only diagnostic accepted by the FDA for mild to moderate traumatic brain injury is Glasgow coma. And Glasgow coma, everybody admits, is not a good diagnostic for mild to moderate. It may be good for CT positive people, but it's not good for mild or moderate, moderate in telling them patient outcomes six months down the road. And, and, and it was almost like, Okay, if the only test you have doesn't work on mild or moderate, it's kind of like taking a 100-question multiple-choice test, you hand it over to the proctor, and they pick up the wrong key and stick it on it. And even though you got 100 questions right, you only get 60 right because it was the wrong key. And that's where we are right now with diagnostics of mild and moderate traumatic brain injury, which makes it very, very difficult to get down the road and find you know, something we can use to, um, to help treat it. We're not treated, to train it. Um, I didn't mean to hit well, oh, okay. <laughs> And if I could speak just a quick moment, thank you for bringing up the question about other brain injury populations. Because as, as we know, brain injury, it's actually f for youth the, the number one cause of death and long-term disability for kids in this country. It's a big issue. And in fact, the, the prison population is one that's been uh, of great interest lately. There's research popping up all over the country now looking at prison populations and the incidence of, of brain injury. In other words, individuals in those situations who do have a history of brain injury. And the numbers are really alarming. We're seeing that upwards of about 80%, as many as 80% of individuals in our criminal justice system uh, may have have a history of brain injury. So this is certainly a very important population. And, and we even look at it as somebody working with youth as, well, is it the fact that they've had a brain injury that have kind of led them to, to, to lead a life of crime or you know, kind of the chicken and the egg sort of argument, but it can certainly have an impact on how you, um, you know, intervene with these individuals during their prison stay as well. Um, brain injury, it's very important for us to identify uh, be aware and, and then move really what we know about positive treatments and positive changes that can be made to, to working with that group in particular. Okay, uh, another question? Hi, I'm Leila Zai and I'm so glad I made it here today. I heard about it just last minute and I'm so excited to actually practice my battle breath because so many of the things that you all have said echo so strongly with an integrated understanding of TBI and PTSD that I think is only recently on the horizon. For I left an academic position at Harvard to study what to me seemed like such a huge problem, TBI. And I came in looking at it as, in and of itself, a very distinct disorder. Oh, look, there's also all these horrible things that come with it, PTSD, chronic pain, chronic fatigue. and the more I looked at the data as when I worked at the, with the Navy, the more I realized these are probably not randomly correlated events and perhaps are not even different disorders that are happening to the same people. Um, so much of the data now suggests that what we consider the comorbidities with TBI and PTSD are actually in the same family of pathologies that if you deconstruct the greater problem, all of these things are linked. I wrote down some thoughts in slightly more structured fashion, but I wanted to 
just hear what you have to say about um, the things that affect <coughs> me. For example, um, when you several people mentioned that PTSD, the D in PTSD, um, should be dropped. What it reminds me of is what in the 60s was called hysteria in women, which eventually turned out to be uh, anywhere, anything between severe anxiety, depression, and multiple other disorders. Um, and now as we've teased it apart, we realize that each of them has an entirely different ideology, but we just combine them all to say you're hysterical. Yeah. Do you, do you have a question in mind? I do. Okay. If you just hang on one second. <laughs> And I think what it really comes down to is adaptive and maladaptive mechanisms. So somebody mentioned that um, you don't go to a woman who's been violently raped and say, you have a disorder. Initially, what happens is a very adaptive mechanism. Your limbic system becomes kindled, and you respond in a certain way. Eventually, that might be deemed as a maladaptive response. A lot of people who a lot of the people who have these diagnoses, such as PTSD, chronic pain, chronic fatigue, if we were to use emerging technologies, for example, the mesoscale definition of how the brain functions, which I know is something DARPA is working on, we will probably see very different pathways that are causing, as with hysteria. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, the panel members will be available after, afterwards. Could, could, you, uh, could you get to your question? Mm -hmm. Sure, yes, sorry. Thank you. Um, do you see the level of funding basically coming forward so that we can do a mesoscale analysis of what these various pathways are doing? Sorry, I was being long winded because it's a very particular part of it I want people to address. We're basically, in order to be able to define these pathologies and retrain the brain, and that's actually the correct term, I'm not apologizing for treatment. Retraining is the only way to get rid of these disorders. To retrain the brain, we're going to have to have that mesoscale understanding of the brain. Is anyone actually putting forward the funding to understand the wiring of the prefrontal and limbic cortices to then be able to retrain the brain in a systematic fashion so that people can be whole? Yeah. So, so I in can their answer this ways. question for you. So, so yes. Yeah. So, Thank you. some of our new DARPA programs, we are interfacing with the brain at multiple levels of abstraction. So, everything down from single neurons all the way up to large-scale brain networks. And uh, you know, as you say, yes, looking at all of those circuits at multiple levels, that is going to help deepen our knowledge on, on these things. So, so that's the wave of the future. Yeah. Is there a greater funding that's going to come down to actually yep. enable that level of work? Because these new programs are doing. enabling it, precisely. Yeah, but the, the, the brain project is it, what? How much? President yeah. Vapping, 100 million, 200 million? Yeah. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say it's 200 million. Yeah. 200 million. Yeah. That's a tall order for 200 million dollars. Sure. Unless you do things totally different than you've ever done it before. I what don't was see the that genome happening. project? How, how much was genome? About a billion? Is that? I think it was billion. Yeah. I think it was billion. Yeah. We're, yeah. We're, you know, I, I, I applaud it. It's got everybody talking. Yes, it's going to take a public private partnership to put it together. But we're, we're going to have to do things differently, put a whole bunch more money than $200 million against it if we're going to get right. at this problem. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm trying to say. So, so just a clarification, problem. that's for the first year of the, of the program. And you know, there's, a, there's a call out there for an all-hands-on-deck approach to the BRAIN initiative. So more industry, academic partnerships in order to move this forward. We have another question over here. My name is uh, James Parks. My question is for uh, Dr. Cook. Um, I've looked at the activities of people who have uh, autism and uh, Asperger's, and some of them have connected the dots between early childhood brain injuries. I happen to be one of those people. And so I was wondering, what is the research in connecting the dots between the early childhood brain injuries and then having some type of autistic and or savant type of activities? Sure, thank you for your question. Uh, you know, I, I can't attest to, the, to any sort of, say, causative evidence that's, that's linked to autism or Asperger's uh, to brain injury specifically. I can, however, state that there is a lot of work looking at brain injury in childhood and the effect on social cognition and social functioning, which, as we know, is one of the, the primary um, presentations or, or difficulty areas for individuals with those 
uh, with, with autism. Um, and, and so what we can often see is that these young people may present with some of these um, pretty distinct social difficulties later in life. I think there's a lot of work to show this is particularly evident come adolescence, when as we can imagine, a lot of these uh, social cognition aspects are being called upon. So while I don't think that there is any evidence at this point indicating a, a direct link between the two, I think we certainly s see some common ground between the, the social deficits that can happen, particularly after a more severe brain injuries. Okay, another question over here. George Breitenberg. It's against Alzheimer's. Um, oh. I'm sorry. Oh. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> so um, we've made some progress in the Alzheimer's field in terms of imaging and a variety of things, a pre-symptomatic a, a pre presentation. Uh, and we've got a good deal of attention now politically. But I've got a question for General Torelli and, and one for uh, Dr. Sanchez. Um, to try and mobilize the American people around certain topics in order to get greater political throw weight against the funding issues. Um, you've organized One Mind for Research on the view that neuropsychiatric uh, diseases or conditions more broadly is the way to look at this, both from a scientific point of view and to sort of unify the, you know, the fields of all of the brain disorders, which, as you point out, uh, uh, cost the nation so much money and affect so many people. And yet I'm working in Alzheimer's, you're working in TBI, and the real question for you is how you see the poli changing the politics of this by either integrating or segregating all of these various brain functions so that autism gets its weight, Alzheimer's gets its, TBI gets it, and somehow in the aggregate we move the political apparatus forward. So for Dr. Sanchez, one, and I agree completely with uh, General Chiarelli about the need to change our attitude towards sharing data. Uh, but our scientists are motivated not to share data because, in fact, the way they get published, uh, publications is by holding back as much data as possible, only publishing good results so that they can get on the higher list at NIH to get funded. So they don't share. Industry is not a sharing institution for either IP reasons or for competitive reasons. The most progressive force in this field is the U.S. government and its agencies to nudge those fields forward and to find mechanisms either through funding conditions uh, or at the FDA through processing speeds that favor those companies that share? Is there a way to unify the federal agencies around certain goals in the data sharing field to move the scientific and industry fields forward? So. You want to go first? Sure. Uh, I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> Um, so, uh, just for the audience here, if you've never worked with DARPA before, so we don't typically award grants. We award contracts. And what that means is that our performers on our pro programs, their success moving forward depends upon their progress, their timeliness of the delivery of what they said that they were going to do. And uh, you know, it's completely reality that if they do not deliver, we can cut them off and say, look, you're not doing it. We're going to give this, uh, these funds to somebody else. With that being said, on all of our new brain-related projects, we are contractually obligating the performers to share their data. Okay? Everybody that works on all of the programs that I am overseeing is required to share their data with anybody else on the program, as well as the broader aspects of, of the scientific community. Now, this is easier said than done. There is not yet an established infrastructure to support something like this. So one of the things that DARPA is trying to figure out right now is how to do this as effectively uh, as possible. So we're going to be working hard to press upon that one. And you know, this also relates to the general's uh, comment. You know, the brain isn't an organ you should uh, study in a fragmented way. We need to put the pieces of the puzzle together and study it in a cohesive way. And that comment also extends back to your, um, your statement about, well, are you going to study Alzheimer's or TBI and, or, or things like this? In my mind, you know, there's a continuum amongst these different uh, conditions. And I, I think that through this data sharing and uh, looking at the brain in a little different way, we're going to identify that continuum in a more clear way and use it more effectively for, for delivering uh, our, our therapies back. Uh, one last comment here. Uh, you also mentioned the aspect of uh, having scientific publication as being the outcome of this kind of work or your, your next R01 grant that you su submit. 
from my perspective, that's exactly the wrong way to do this. For me, it's delivering therapies back to the American people, meaningful therapies that restore functions. So, you know, I, I, all of my efforts are going into, How are you into that. Age to take your approach? Yeah, that's also a great question. So, in the, in, on the President's Brand Initiative, all of the three uh, you know, major funding agencies, NIH, NSF, and DARPA, are coming together in order to tr try to find more strategic ways to, to leverage our resources. And this comment also extends to our friends at the FDA. So you can imagine on all of our new, at least DARPA's neuroscience uh, programs, there's a huge human component to that. So how can we accelerate innovation and new therapies uh, to humans? We're all you know, you know, saying this is a goal. We need to work together as federal agencies in order to make this happen. I was just at the FDA the other day talking about this very issue. And uh, we have some, some great people there that we've interfaced with that I think are going to help us make it happen. Uh, you, you asked the 64, well, that really dates me, 64,000. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, yeah, let's go with a billion. You, you're, you're exactly right, George. We have got to change the incentive system, and that's what's really hard. It's not only the medical incentive system and how docs get promoted through publications, first author, last author, don't get buried in the middle. Um, it's the data they collect is their data, and they're used to keep their labs going. They've all got, you know, kids to send to college, and, and that, that's the way the incentive system is set up. That's the way the publication policy set, is set up. I came from a profession that if you didn't pass out information immediately, the American people would come back and just, they'd fire me if somebody got hurt downrange because I was husbanding intelligence, you know, that could have saved a son or daughter downrange. Yet we find it perfectly fine here for a, for a medical breakthrough to occur and be held hostage to a publisher of a major journal. And then once it's published, six, eight, ten months later, okay, a lot of people can't afford it, can't buy it, can't get their hands on it. And, and the NIH will t tell you, it takes from eight to twelve years on major discoveries to get it out into the field and, and broadly accepted in all of medicine. I mean, it is, we have got to change the incentive system. And I'm not saying blow the whole thing up, I'm just saying sit down and say, okay, what's changed since we passed by Dole and set up all the tech transfer offices in the universities? What has changed? What has changed is our ability to take huge data sets and make sense of them where we were never able to do it before. We need to have NIH, in my opinion, has to have the ability to do exactly what you're saying. It'll be interesting to see how the university lobbyists pop in on this. <laughs> they've got to have the ability that once everybody sits down and comes up with common data elements, that the research they fund will be, will be done using those common data elements. So when you take all the desperate studies that are out there and combine them together, you, the data makes sense because curating data is really, really expensive. That's what we're doing with Track TBI. We found 11 institutions all around the country, three in Texas, two in Dallas, who, who have agreed to go ahead and take 111 to share their data internally, and at the end of six months after they're done, release their data to the whole world. You know, I, whenever I'm talking this issue, I, I go back to my women issue, because women are the only thing that people get things done in this country. If you're a woman in this country, how many people how, how many women know whether they should follow the standard of care and get a mammography at, at age 40 every single year when this new test comes out? And, and the issue here is we've got two groups of people. They're both publishing their findings. No one's providing their data and laying it on a table so you could make a decision on, okay, what should the standard of care be and what are the holes in the research of both studies or the myriad of studies we've got out there on mammography that would lead us to a better answer so that women would know what to do. And that's what we don't have. And I can promise you, two years from now, you're going to be driving to work. There's going to be something that's going to talk about, OK, the definitive study has been done on mammography. Now you're supposed to, you know, whatever it says. It's kind of like coffee. I'm feeling really good now because I'm from Seattle, and the last study that came out says coffee's good for you. <laughs> but I promise, six months from now, there will be a study out telling me how I am ruining my body by drinking two cups of coffee a day. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, panel. It's been very interesting. Do you have one more?